Hello everyone and welcome back to the Vintage Hi-Fi Guide. Now, some of uh, the more observant of you will know, or will see I should say, that uh, I'm in a new place and uh, this is the result of a bit of a, uh, a life laundry. Uh, we've moved home, um, we've uh, downsized a little bit and uh, uh, and also it's given me a bit of a new impetus as it were to try and get some of the hi-fi systems and hi-fi components out of boxes that were in storage um, and uh, bring them back to life and also sell a few bits and pieces so i thought what i'm going to do is i'm going to try and get the channel back up and running again uh, because i've had some really good feedback uh, during the last six months while well, I haven't been all that active on YouTube and Facebook and whatever. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to refocus a little bit on uh, vintage hi-fi from the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, and also I'm going to bring some new tech as well into the channel uh, as we head towards Christmas and into 2023. But more on that later on. Um, but the reason for the video today is a very special bit of equipment which came my way, I guess, during the first lockdown uh, in the pandemic. So this is going back to what, March, April 2020. And um, many of you will know my love for a particular era in uh, hi-fi component world, which was uh, between 1980 and 1982-83 and these components were brought to you by Marantz and Marantz was a predominantly US brand of uh, the of a Japanese company known as Marantz and these were um, the early days of um, new technology but it wasn't all that new but it was technology which was uh, which was able to bring um, really good quality hi-fi to the masses for a start, but also by some th the use of uh, quite modern semiconductors at the time, or transistors, I should say, um, uh, uh, some real modern amplification, um, hi-fi components shrunk. So whilst uh, the, the width of hi-fi components remain pretty much the same and remains to this day pretty much the same, is some of you remember in the 70s, um, particularly amplifiers, receivers and the like were quite big and bulky. And in some ways, the US market actually wanted hi-fi components to stay that way because there was almost a sort of um, a male penis sized thing going on with hi-fi components at the time whereby if it was big and thick and it was big and wide and it had wooden sides on it then it was bound to be good and a lot of Japanese brands really fell into that trap and I'm particularly thinking at the time of, um, of uh, Pioneer and Kenwood which created these big bulky old things um, yeah pretty good performance um, but they were more about status on the shelf more than they were uh, hi-fi quality. Now, interestingly, is when you see some of uh, the new Netflix and Prime shows and the like, um, it, you will see a lot of these components which date back to the 70s and 80s. But something changed in the early to mid-1980s, and this was a lot to do with the European market. And the European market was predominantly targeted at homes which were much smaller than the US market and some would say more design conscious. And therefore, the European market required slimmer components um, and smaller components as well, which I will come on to in a separate video when uh, when I talk about Aurex micro and mini hi-fi systems. And so Marantz were really new to this party and created probably one of the finest amplifiers ever created in the early 1980s and many reviewers at the time thought rivaled the uh, NAD or NAD 3020 and they created this okay which is the Marantz PM 350 and this was what Marantz called a console stereo amplifier it used new transistor technology um, of what I think it was either 29 or 30 transistors went into this unit. Um, it created, um, it also had a linear heat sink, which instead of being 
uh, instead of requiring either a fan to cool it uh, or not requiring fins on the rear panel, actually used a central heat sink which ran all the way through the amplifier, cooled the transistors, cooled the circuitry, and therefore was able effectively to reduce the height of the unit, did away with a lot of the heavy bulky old capacitors that were around at the time. So with six or so integrated circuits, 30 or so transistors, this particular beast was able to deliver really good sound quality, real punchy sound quality, 38 watts per channel, which was always a bit peculiar, but driven into eight ohms, 38 watts actually became more like 45 or 50 watts. So for many of us, when uh, when driving, really quite difficult to drive loudspeakers at the time, this thing produced incredible sound quality. And I was really fortunate to own one of these uh, after leaving school, going into my first job. And some of you remember in earlier videos, the partnership of a Marantz PM350 with a Marantz uh, CD63 uh, CD player, and actually what was at the moment a pair of Marantz LD100 loudspeakers were, you know, created really earth shattering sound quality, as my late parents would attest that uh, I was still living at home at the time. And I think their house and the neighbors houses used to uh, shake profusely uh, when playing uh, some of my uh, dance music through the, uh, the PM350. So many, many years later, I decided to come and rekindle my love of the 350. And uh, as I say, back in the pandemic, I came across one. Now, these things now are in not great supply, and a lot of the stock is well used, as you would expect from an amplifier which dates back to 1980 to 82. Um, there are two uh, distinct models. Uh, there's a US model, which was US tuned, and a European model, uh, which was Euro tuned. Both have exactly the same specification, but the sound quality on the US model is distinctly different. Um, some people will say that it's actually tinnier, brighter, whatever, uh, whatever adjective, uh, adjective you want to call it, but nevertheless, the European model does have uh, a distinctly different sound quality. 230, 240 volt as well, so you don't need to have a look at the uh, step-up transformer. Um, so this particular amplifier is very much on my recommended list. And it, all of the inquiries that I was getting last year through YouTube and Facebook and whatever, people looking for a really good quality, uh, relatively budget-priced amplifier, I would always recommend them to go down this route. So PM350, or um, or a, a NAB3020 if you still get your hands on one. But I've noticed that over the last 12 months or so, the prices of this particular model have gone through the roof, uh, which of course very much suggests that the stock that's out there at the moment is dwindling. Um, the engineers that can repair uh, this model and are struggling to get hold of parts which match uh, the specification of parts within it. Uh, and therefore, if you are looking for a particular beast like this, you need to be quick and you need to make sure that it's working correctly. Now, um, this particular model was famous for uh, the output level uh, meters on the front. There were actually two models which used the same LED um, analysis thing on the front. And one was called the PM310, which I think from recollection was 25 watts per channel. It didn't have the mid range uh, on the equalizer or the tone control here. Um, and also it, it was a lot thinner in terms of sound quality. It didn't get the plaudits anything like the PM350. Whereas this beast had these very uh, interesting uh, power output levels on the front. Now, the uh, markings that you see on here uh, were never particularly accurate, but it actually created a really beautiful effect at night. It was very eye-catching. It was very retail at the time. And bearing in mind, these things were sold not just in purist hi-fi dealers. They were sold mass market. You know, we could, you, we could see these in high street retailers where these uh, output levels on the front really did stand out from the crowd. Um, so we're really quite bold. And interestingly, a lot of people at the time, particularly the higher end audiophile um, reviewers, really didn't like flashing lights. They didn't like tone controls. They didn't like flashing lights. 
This was one of the only amplifiers at the time which delivered sonically as well as looked really good on the shelf. And of course, as I've said before, the 350 common with Marantz uh, hi-fi separates from 78 to 85 was finished in this champagne gold. And one of the things that you'll see now with a lot of uh, these amplifiers is that the champagne gold has begun to corrode maybe, that's probably not the right word, but has um, become to sort of dim a little bit, doesn't look quite as shiny. And particularly when you look around the volume control on some amps, you can see there's a lot of dirt, uh, which has then been, some people have tried to clean. The reason I spent a lot of money on this particular model is one, the transistors have been serviced, uh, but also as you'll see, it's in amazing condition. I mean, I would almost go as far to say that this is as new. It's even got the Made in Japan uh, sticker still on it. There's not one scratch on the front panel, not one scratch on the top. And as you'll see on the rear, the uh, everything is pretty much as it would be. And it comes, of course, with a power lead, which um, it has a peculiar power lead on here. And, um, and so the, yeah, this comes with the original power lead. Now, one of the things you will notice on this amplifier, and it's, it's the one thing that I really criticize this for, and that is the few amounts of uh, inputs that you see on here. So you've got phono, uh, tuner, uh, auxiliary input, and also one cassette, um, and a tape two input as well. But as you can see, they are pretty um, sparse, to put it that way. And that was, Definitely one of the things that made this less popular than, say, the NAD or other amplifiers at the time, which seemed to be adding uh, lots of extra, um, lots of extra inputs. Uh, Technics, in particular, uh, for amplifiers at the time, were adding um, extra inputs for um, video disc and uh, VCR at the time, uh, despite them not being home cinema equipment is there was a move certainly by the Matsushita organization to believe that hi-fi VCR uh, or some sort of digital recordable format such as DAT was going to be an important um, upcoming technology and therefore they specified their amplifiers towards that. Marantz of course at that time didn't expect to be part of a digital future you know there simply wasn't uh, a digital recording format in place at the time for Marantz and whilst Marantz and Philips were there co-designing and, and co-producing the CD63 and the CD100 the first CD players in the market they really weren't looking ahead to a digital recording format where of course um, Philips, Sony uh, and the like were developing digital uh, recordable digital formats and Matsushita of course were, were developing hi-fi VHS at the time they were playing a part in the DAT uh, format so there were lots of uh, extra inputs on Matsushita based equipment whereas Marantz didn't see that. So this was a very purist amplifier and what I'd be saying is if you are looking for an amp which performs really well with analog formats uh, or uh, CD without the need for optical or, or digital coaxial inputs this is definitely an amplifier for you and of course if you've got particularly tricky to drive loudspeakers and I'm thinking um, uh, things like LS35As, I'm thinking Griffin Phoenix, I'm thinking a, a, a Haybrook HB1s and 2s, the original Kef coders, any of those older loudspeakers whereby, well, let's, let's face it, some of the crossover uh, tech in those uh, may be uh, a little bit old, a bit like myself at the moment, those speakers require you to have a really good amp behind them and uh, the Murantz PM350 will do that. Um, in terms of the product itself, I'm going to be selling this one uh, because as I say, we have downsized and what I'm trying to do at the moment is go through all of the equipment that I want to sell um, and also to retain the bits that I really want to keep. I'm looking to the right at the moment because I've set myself up with a, a Technic system uh, recently, which includes a really nice receiver, the GX130, uh, which is a really nice piece of kit, sonically very similar to the Marantz in some ways, 
Um, but uh, because of where we're living at the moment, I think I'll be using headphones an awful lot more. So I've invested recently in a pair of new Technics uh, Hi-Fi headphones, which I'm going to put a review together on very soon. So if you're interested in the Marantz PM350, DM me, email me, let me know. Um, I will gladly send anywhere in the UK and also if you're looking for an international send as well, I can look into that. But as some of you may know, uh, international parcels are pretty tricky right now. So ideally, if you're in the UK looking for a really beautiful, uh, in excellent condition, Moran's PM350, let me know. All the price details and the like will, will be below. Uh, or I may even put it onto Facebook Marketplace or to eBay as well. But uh, keep abreast on the channel. So as I say, Moran's PM350, a really nice part of the Moran's range at the time. I think even uh, even the naysayers of Japanese hi-fi tech from the early 80s would say that this is a really, really good quality amplifier. And bearing in mind the size, so this thing is relatively sleek, console amplifier, relatively sleek, and will very nicely fit in with some uh, more discreet hi-fi components at the time, rather than having to be big and bold and brash and wooden sides and the like. Now, bearing in mind, of course, if you look back through my videos, you will see that Marantz at the time were also producing console amplifiers, which were bigger and chunkier. Uh, and some, I believe, also had uh, wooden sides on. Um, and that was very much down to where they were marketed. As I say, this was a, an amp that was targeted at the European market, but also became available uh, in the United States. Okay, so it, there was definitely a move to creating slimmer, sleeker uh, components for the European market. Um, and as you will see, if you look at Moran's brochure ware from the time between 1980 and 1985, that move towards slimmer, sleeker components was, was of course, um, around the time that CD players were launched. Now, interestingly, the Moran's CD63 CD player, which was arguably the first CD player that broke into the European market, it was a clone of the Philips uh, model at the time, don't quote me on the model number, I can't quite remember. But those top-loading CD players were completely different in size to the CD63, uh, sorry, to the PM350 and all the other amplifiers at the time. And, you know, um, one of the things, and I'm going to talk about this in a future video, but when those CD players were developed, when they were on the production line, which was uh, pre-production, sorry, three or four years before production, there was a feeling in the design teams that the uh, that the CD player would completely replace the turntable. And therefore, this thing that sits on top of a, a hi-fi cabinet, as it were, uh, in and around that time would be the perfect replacement for the turntable. But of course, it wasn't quite the case straight away because people had huge collections of vinyl, huge uh, collections of cassettes, and this thing sitting on top of the hi-fi cabinet replacing the turntable um, didn't work. And that's why draw loading CD formats followed really quickly uh, behind the CD63. And those draw loading formats actually, strangely, were the same size as a standard hi-fi component or roughly the same size as a hi-fi component. Um, and... Uh, actually didn't need to be. The circuitry in there was relatively small, relatively packed in, as it were, and therefore um, the, the necessity, no, the uh, brands felt comfortable with using a hi-fi component of a particular width, and that's pretty much stayed that way then through the 80s, 90s, and even present day, uh, that if you can buy brand new hi-fi components, you'll see they're very much of the same sort of size. So that was a very, very quick skip through the Marantz PM350. Couple of things to note, European or US version, check the voltage um, and uh, make sure that you buy one for your local market. If you can, try and find the pedigree of the unit. Have the transistors been replaced? Has the volume potentiometer been replaced? Which I know is a quite a tricky article to get hold of. 
um, and whether or not uh, it is getting particularly warm. Now, these amplifiers don't run all that hot compared to a lot of the late 70s products with huge capacitors in there. So these run pretty cool thanks to that uh, lateral um, heat sink uh, within the unit, which spread the heat out over the, uh, the, the complete with the unit. If it's getting very hot, then I would avoid it. Um, because that normally suggests that something isn't working particularly well with either the transistors mounted on the heatsink or something else going on. These things don't run all that hot, so just be a little bit careful of that. Um, pretty much everything else in there is, is going to be working or should be working okay. I know that some people have said that the meters are a real good giveaway, so the LEDs on the front. Now, as you'll remember, the LEDs are in this V-shaped pattern on the front. One green LED in the middle, five power LEDs on there. Now, on this particular unit, the LEDs themselves are still really quite bright, and there's no reason at all why these things should be dimmed really over time unless there's something wrong with the LED driver within that part of the circuit. Some people have said to me that the green LED tends to burn out quicker. I'm not sure how true that is. Certainly in all the models that I've either seen for sale or asked questions about before I bought this unit, I haven't seen anything like that. So it might, might be just worth a check, but um, don't take that as read from me. So it's, as I say, it's location. Make sure the power output's the same. Uh, check for discoloration. So these amps that have got dirt and not just grime, but almost scratches around the volume control, avoid them like the plague. They've been very well used, very hard driven. I also know that at the time, around about 30 odd thousand of these things were sold in, th in a three year period in the UK. So that does suggest that UK market, there will be quite a few still either in garages, sheds uh, or lofts. Now, of course, we're now what? Uh, 40 years down the road from this thing being uh, uh, being launched, or maybe even discontinued. So therefore, if these uh, items have been used maybe until the late 80s and then put in storage, that's uh, 30 years of storage. So there will definitely be some noise on the potentiometers, on the volume control um, and the like. I know I've seen these with the bass and treble controls also a little bit noisy, so you may need to get some deoxid on there or get a really good uh, engineer to come and take the lid off and have a look for you. Price-wise, at the moment, I think um, a, a good quality PM350 is going to cost you somewhere around about £150, roughly. Um, bearing in mind that these were sold at £89.99 and then £79.99 in the UK. They're an absolute bargain, really, at the time compared to the NAT3020, which was around about £100. But those prices held for many, many years. That really does underline the popularity of these things. Uh, and as I say, a good quality one now is going to be in the region of £150, which is roughly where this one's going to be sold. And finally, make sure it's got a pass. Um, uh, a socket, a plug with it, a um, uh, because the socket isn't, uh, it isn't a, uh, it isn't a popular socket. It's not just a figure of eight mains power lead. So just make sure that it comes with the lead. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, but yeah, it's really good. If you want to ask me any questions about this particular model, as I say, DM me, email me, whatever. If you want to ask more generic questions about Marantz at the time and what was going on and their partnerships with uh, Philips and other manufacturers at the time, you know I am more than happy to answer questions or comments on the uh, YouTube video. So thanks very much for tuning back in. I'm going to um, start thinking about topics that we can discuss and that we, I can bring to you on the YouTube channel. Um, I'm also thinking of trying to reinstate the podcast as well, which may be quite uh, interesting if you want to talk around uh, uh, around hi-fi and the like at the time. I'm also going to be uh, talking about uh, new technology, as I say, which is uh, coming down the line, and particularly the Technics uh, launch of... Esoteric? No. 
audiophile quality hi-fi uh, and uh, the the Matsushita brands jumping back into that market sector which I find absolutely fascinating from a marketing perspective and um, yeah one could say quite risky um, particularly when there's so much really good quality second-hand technic stuff still out there in the market but anyway that's for a future video um, enjoy the PM350 uh, what I will do is put some photos together and uh, maybe even a short video as well and uh, and build it into this video somewhere. So thanks very much again for watching. Welcome back to the Vintage Hi-Fi Guy. And as I say, I'm very much hoping to uh, uh, to be bringing you new videos every three or four weeks. Thanks. Bye.